Yes, we are coming to our last lecture on utopias. How can I, as an art historian, speak about utopias in our day and age? There are plenty of reasons why I probably shouldn't. I'd like to name some of the difficulties involved. For one thing, the subject itself is definitely out. Since the collapse of the so-called socialist bloc, any talk about utopias has become anathema. The words utopian and utopist have depreciated to the point of actually becoming terms of abuse. Utopia, a dangerous fantasy. On the other hand, it is true that the notion of utopia is one of interest to those who concern themselves with the study and analysis of culture. Because after all, utopias have entirely to do with conceptions per se. Utopias constitute a topic in literary studies. They are also a subject of discussion and research in the fields of philosophy, sociology and the history of political science, but not really in art history. Apart from the fact that art is often considered to possess, in a very general sense, a utopian potential. Whatever the case may be, to my knowledge, there has been no art historical research that focuses on utopian art a focus that does exist in the field of literary studies. Unlike other topics that I have covered in this lecture series, I have never personally made this one a subject of research, which means that what I'm presenting here represents an initial approach and reflections that I would like to share with you and nothing more. It was Sir Thomas More who coined the term utopia for his eponymous novel published in 1516. The word is formed by the combination of two Greek words, namely u meaning no or not and topos meaning place. Utopia means then a no place. The negative prefix in Greek, however, is not u, but a. Think of words like asymmetry, asocial, atypical, etc. The word utopia, beginning with the letter u, when spoken in English, sounds as if it could just as well be written with a Greek prefix spelled eu, which signifies good or pleasant. Think of the words euphoria or euphonic. So, <clears throat> so utopia spell, spelled with EU would mean a good or pleasant place. The term newly created by Thomas More was therefore a deliberately ambiguous word formation, in other words, a pun. The English scholar, humanist, judge and chancellor of England, Thomas More, describes in his novel an imagined ideal state, state in the sense of body politic or country, and calls his state utopia. He tells of an encounter with an acquaintance of his friends, Gillis, in the city of Antwerp. The acquaintance's name is Raphael. This Raphael recounts that in the course of his many travels, he discovered an unknown island where he then spent five years of his life. Utopia is founded on the abolition of both private property and money. In the first part of the book, Raphael tells of a trip he made to England where he was appelled to learn that common thieves were hanged. He explains that these people had been driven to stealing so that they could then be hanged. Driven to stealing, 
either in the sense that the men had been dismissed from their functions by noblemen, because the country did not happen to be at war at the time, which meant that these men had become redundant, or in the sense that these unfortunate people had been driven from their farms because the land barons needed vast areas of grazing land for their sheep, for the manufacture of wool. In Utopia, Raphael sees proof that when private property and money have been abolished, there is no more real crime to speak of. In Utopia, working time has been reduced to six hours a day. The inhabitants of Utopia spend the rest of their day primarily educating themselves. In Utopia, there is, in principle, freedom of religion, a freedom that is predicated, however, on belief in a divine being and in the immortality of the soul. Atheists are scorned and ostracized by the Utopians. The guiding principle in Utopia is reason. With their neighbors, the Utopians engage in trade. They abominate war. There are, however, contradictions in Utopia. For example, when serious crimes are committed, something that rarely happens, the perpetrators are forced to do slaver labor in chains. When a community of people is not making use of the land, another community of people is allowed to appropriate that land. This sounds like an anticipation of English colonial rule. Utopia is not simply an ideal state. What is essentially being presented with the concept of utopia is a form of discourse centering on the question of how an ideal state could be constituted. In utopia, what is not wanted is what matters first. The following is a quotation from Thomas Schöderle's Geschichte der Utopie, History of Utopia, published in 2017, I quote. Criticism is of more central importance and closer to the essence of utopia than any supposed never-never land. And Schöderle further writes, I quote, in their classical form, utopias are in almost all cases, experiments with rational thought that are intended first and foremost to be a mirror held up to contemporary society. The text's function is to stimulate reflection on the fundaments of contemporary historical reality." End of quote. I might add parenthetically that Sir Thomas More was eventually beheaded by Henry VIII because he refused to join the Anglican Church, which King Henry had created solely for the purpose of being able to divorce. Other utopias, and there have been a lot of them, while deferring in various ways, are for the most part also travel goals. The location of the ideal state is an island. This ideal state is founded on the principle of the abolition of money and private property, the notions of equality and justice, recourse to reason, the reduction of working hours, and the dispensing with the production of unnecessary goods. The impossible is conjured up so that the possible can be seen. Criticism of the grim social and political state of affairs is more important than the portrayal of any dream world. In the late 18th century, the utopian locus is projected into the future. A shift takes place from a spatial dimension to a temporal dimension. The form of utopia that I have been describing is not found in the visual arts. 
In what follows, I shall take as my point of departure a broadened conception of utopia. The German political scientist Ernst Bloch, in his major work, Das Prinzip Hoffnung, The Hope Principle, which he wrote in his American exile between 1938 and 1947, and published in 1959, describes utopian thinking as virtually a state of consciousness inherent in man. To think, writes Bloch, means to go beyond. It means taking reality as one's point of departure, to seek, to imagine, to aspire towards a possible towards a better future. But it should always be thought of as a dynamic process, as a movement that remains open-ended. Bloch writes that art is for shine, a word that can be translated as prefiguration, and which Bloch hyphenates in order to stress a prefix. Art, he writes, is the use of aesthetic means to represent the possible. I find that this makes very good sense. My purpose today is to address a question of a somewhat narrow scope, namely, what explicit examples of representation of utopian notions can be found in the visual arts? Dreams of an ideal life exist and have certainly existed in all cultures. Often it is a conception of a beginning in which everything was still good, and this is the Garden of Eden, paradise. Christianity then deferred paradise to the hereafter. It was for God and not for man to establish equality and justice. As a result of the fall of man, all promise of happiness in this world was lost. Antiquity also knew the concept of an ideal beginning. The first description of the Golden Age is ascribed to his youth and dates from around 700 BC. The basic idea was that nature, which was plentiful, allowed man to live a carefree life. At the time of that beginning, Kronos, the father of Zeus, ruled over all. People did not have to work. There was no private property, therefore there was peace. When Zeus became the ruler, things began to change for the worse. Man had to begin cultivating the land. It was only towards the end of this beginning phase, when things were at their worst, that the notion of private property was introduced. Along with private property came envy and resentment, man's power over man and war. I find it striking that in practically all conceptions of utopia, private property is the root of all evil. When artists wanted to depict paradise on earth, the idea of happiness here on earth, they were forced to draw on pagan myth. After all, in the Garden of Eden, there were only Adam and Eve. And the animals, as depicted here in a painting by Roland Savary. But actually, these scenes makes, ra makes one rather think of a zoo. Another example is Lucas Cranach's Golden Age. Cranach has walled off his paradise. Beyond the wall, one can see that the landscape scratches on into the distance. This paradise comes across not so much as an overall vision, 
a something reminiscent of a nudist camp. Here, paradise itself is constructed like the Garden of Eden. Naked men and women are shown dancing around an apple tree, which of course reminds us of the tree of life with its forbidden fruit. And like a foretoken of the fall of man, each naked figure's public error is covered, purely by chance, as it were, by a branch or a leaf. The woman I adorned with necklaces, something unthinkable in the golden age. The overall aesthetic structure, the meticulous style that characterizes the work, the human figures resembling paper cutouts, and for that reason, hardly seeming to be integrated into the natural setting. All of this combines to create an impression that actually clashes with that of an, earth, of an earthly paradise. What this, in fact, is the motif of the golden age, without being an attempt literally to arouse utopian fantasies. Indeed, what is utopian in art lies not in the subject alone, but especially in the way the subject is treated. The Roman poet Virgil, for his conception of the place of earthly happiness, chose Arcadia, a rugged, secluded region of Greece. His bucolic verse is depicting a happy, carefree existence led by shepherds exerted an influence on, little, on later literature and art. The poet Jacopo Zanazaro, this is, he lived at the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th century, in his pastoral romance Arcadia, incorporated a cloak, that is a short poems, that then served as models for modern age pastoral poetry and for painting. Sanazaro in his sixth A Cloak, which echoes Virgil's fourth A Cloak, has the old shepherd Opico sing the praise of the Golden Age. The old shepherd relates that in the Golden Age, the gods themselves were shepherds. They took their sheep to pasture and sang shepherd's songs. The nostalgic portrayal of life in that long gone age a portrayal that is at the same time a grievance about the present offers a familiar motives known from antiquity, including eternal spring, but also an additional element, namely free love. We are told that jealousy did not exist. Also, Sanazo devotes only six verses to this erotic aspect it was of central importance to him. In antiquity, this aspect had not yet become a distinctive feature of the Golden Age. Around the year 1500 in Venice, this motif was also treated as a subject in the visual arts, namely in a painting by Giorgione, which you see here, Fair John Petra, sometimes called Concert Champêtre. In contrast to the literary treatment of the motif, here no story is told. Instead, a specific atmosphere is created. We see a musician from the city, a shepherd and naked female figures, most likely nymphs, all enjoying a peaceful moment of leisure in each other's company. In painting since the Renaissance, two utopian aspects are dominant. The first is man's being at one with nature, and the second is love. As examples, I would like to show you works by two artists, Rubens and Poussin, both of whom were 17th century painters. Peter Paul Rubens' Feast of Venus is a late work by the master painted around 1637 and can be admired here in Jena at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. 
The title does not make reference to an earthly paradise or to the golden age. But as we saw a moment ago in the case of Kana's golden age, the title of her work does not necessarily overlap entirely with what is actually portrayed in the work. The way in which Rubens has depicted this scene shatters a narrow framework of the title. In fact, the framework of the very subject of the work. As I see it, Rubens is imagining here the utopia of love. In art historical research, two sources are named on which Rubens drew for this painting. One is a work by Titian, an artist who, whom Rubens held in very high esteem. Rubens produced a copy of Titian's painting which was entitled The Worship of Venus. Titian in his turn had drawn on a written ancient Greek source for his painting, namely a description found in a collection of descriptions of paintings by Philostratus entitled Imagines. In Imagines, Philostratus describes the frescoes of a Roman villa on which is entitled, one of which is entitled Cupids. In a garden with a statue of Venus towering over it, a swarm of Cupids are seen at play, plucking apples from trees, flirting left and right, indulging in all kinds of amorous play. However, Rubens also drew on a second written source, a description found in Ovid's Fasti. In this work, Ovid describes a feast celebrated in honor of the goddess of love and Fortuna, a feast for Venus Verticordia and Fortuna Virilis, which was held on April 1st. Ovid describes how brides and mothers clean the statue of Venus, and then take a bath themselves. This cleansing is also meant in the moral sense. Married women make an offering of incense to Fortuna Virilis. Ovid introduces an innovation with respect to the tradition. He includes prostitutes in the event which is something of a contradiction of the function of the cleaning ritual. Identifying the written and iconographic sources, however, is not enough to allow us to grasp what Rubens' painting is meant to convey. As a Kulturwissenschaftlerin, that is, as someone who concerns herself with the study and analysis of culture, I'm interested in looking for the meaning beyond what can be found in the sources. What the 17th century painting is meant to convey cannot be reduced to mere illustration of ancient texts. So what do we see here? At the center of the painting, at the center of the painting is the statue of Venus, which is being washed by two women. To the right of her, seen from our point of view, stands a prostitute who is recognizable by her almost total nudity and the yellow clothes draped around her. Rushing into the picture from the right are two brides bearing statues of gods as offerings. This movement is extended by a round dance led by Dionysos and the Menads symbols of exuberant lust and ecstasy. Ovid makes no mention of them, nor does he mention those forming the group on the left side of the picture, satires dancing with nymphs. On the outer left is a particularly lascivious satire, lifting a nymph up off the ground. She looks very much like Rubens' wife, Helene Fournon. In dance, this lifting up of the ground stood for the act of love. In the painting, the particular activity 
is only being performed by proxy, as it were, by two pigeons in the right foreground. On the ground and in the air, Cupid's dance widely around Venus, both male and without wings, female. In the foreground are a few theatrical props and musical instruments lying on the ground. On the left, through what is almost a haze, we can see the temple of Venus. Above the waterfall sits a couple with a lion and a bushel of wheat, a reference to the heraldic emblems of Rubens and Helene Fourmont. It's remarkable how Rubens manages to combine three-dimensional speciality and the fullness of sculptural forms and to integrate both qualities into a painted scene. Notice how the put in the background seem almost to dissolve delicately into the light of the sky. Or notice the lightness of the dancing figures in spite of their plump bodies. As I said, I see here utopia of love. Love in all its possible forms. Chaste love, motherly love, conjugal love, unleashed passion and generally sexuality, both real and mythological. <clears throat> Rubens transposes his utopia of love to the realm of myth. The 18th century French painter Antoine Watteau places real aristocratic society dressed in courtly fashion in a natural setting. In his painting entitled The Embarkation for Quitera, the Island of Love, Amorous couples are preparing to embark upon a journey to the island of Venus. This too is a utopian vision. We are shown not the island of Quitera, but the preparation for the journey. This is anticipated happiness, the longing for love and happiness. Not only is the imaginary character of the scene made clear by the motive itself, that is, the act of embarking upon a journey, but the airy painting technique, the landscape, the boat and the various figures create an impression of vagueness and mere suggestion. Nicolas Poussin conceived quite a different form of utopia. Poussin was a 17th century French painter who decidedly distanced himself both from the royal court of the absolutist king in Versailles and from the academy, as well as from the official church. He spent most of his working life in Rome. In his later landscape painting, here landscape with a calm, he created a kind of painting that was contrary Rary to the precepts of the art of the royal court at Versailles under Louis XIV. I show you just as an example um, a painting by Le Brun. I, I cannot go into detail, but it is important to have an awareness of the cultural and political background if one is to understand the implicit criticism and the utopian potential contained in Poussin's work. Let me, let me give you another example, landscape with Polyphene. Polyphene, the one-eyed giant said to have lived during the ages of the Cyclopes, that is during the Golden Age, is seen sitting atop a high rock with his back to the rest of the scene playing his flute. The muse tells the story of the love between Aetis and Galatea. Polyphemus lusted after the sea nymph Galatea, so he killed Aetis. Aetis was then transformed into a river. 
Galatea mourned for him eternally. In the painting, however, we see a peaceful Polyphemus. Aetis and Galatea, along with her nymphs, are shown relaxing in the landscape. A peasant is busy plowing his field, which means we have left the Golden Age and have arrived in civilization. The human figures are small in comparison with a heroic natural setting. They have no individuality. They have been totally integrated into the natural surroundings. For Poussin, nature is a universe that spans and outlasts all historical epochs, and one of which man is an integral part. What count most are the laws of nature, the universal order and harmony. However, Poussin's conception is not that of a true paradise, because his conception includes death. Et in Arcadio Ego. Here, Shepherds are shown deciphering the words inscribed on a sarcophagus, et in Arcadia Ego. It is death who is speaking here. I, too, am in Arcadia. An expression of a profound acceptance of the fact that death is part of life. Here, there is no reference to an afterlife, no reference to a transcendental paradise. There is no moralizing, nor, however, is there despair. You might say, but what all this has to do with utopia? In my view, this stoic attitude, this ability to think of life, Harmony and beauty in conjunction with this is a utopian way of seeing things in the sense that it is a sensible attitude worth striving to acquire. Let's go back again in time to 1516 and to Thomas More's Utopia. At almost that very time, Hieronymus Bosch painted his so-called Garden of Earthly Delights. I find this a remarkable circumstance. This was a period in which it was possible to put forth new alternative concepts, a time of great change. To an extent that had never been known before, it became possible to present individual subjective conceptions of things. There are certain aspects that Bosch and Thomas More have in common. At the same time, however, they couldn't be more different from one each other. What they share is a notion of utopia, a certain form of equality, peaceful cohabitation among all people between black and white, peaceful cohabitation between man and animal. Thomas More was influenced by Amerigo Vespucci's descriptions of his travels. In More's narrative, Raphael also refers explicitly to the explorer. Vespucci describes the natural state of the indigenous people of America, people who knew neither private possession of land nor money. You have to try to imagine what the discovery of a new continent meant, the discovery of a new world inhabited by other people who had entirely different culture. The discovery of the new world also made its way into Bosch's work. This can be seen especially in his depiction of exotic plants and animals some of which he could have known from the encyclopedia known in English as the Nuremberg Chronicle of Schädel's World History. You see this tree uh, 
embossed painting on, on the left side, and which is very similar to what you see in the Schädel's uh, World Chronic, World History. Not only the Bosch was also inspired to create visions of things that had never been seen. The difference between Bosch and Thomas More, however, is considerable. In Thomas More's work, what we are dealing with is an ideal country or stage with a constitution. The absolutely supreme criterion is rationality. In Bosch's work, rationality has been weeded out. What he shows are all the things that the rational mind suppresses. The phantasmagoric, the world of dreams, the unconscious. In Moore's work, nothing is said about love. The relationship between the sexes is only barely touched upon. The relationship between men and women remains within conservative confines. Woman is subordinate to man. Adultery can even be punished by death. <clears throat> with Bosch, everything that has to do with lust and desire manages to come to the surface. In this respect, Bosch can also be contradictory but he deals with the subject. He gives it visual expression. He does not avoid it. For Thomas More, work, civilization, education, and culture are essential notions. In Bosch's work, there is no culture. All the objects that we see, such as the bizarre architectural constructions in the background, are things that have never been produced, otherwise than in a cultural fashion. Nothing here has been made by human hands. Here, there is no strictly ordered world. On the contrary, this is a world in which everything has been turned inside out or upside down. A world where berries and birds are gigantic. <clears throat> Bosch's world cannot be penetrated rationally. Bosch's utopia is still placed within an eschatological context that is between heaven and hell. With Thomas More, this is unthinkable. But in the lecture on the topic of evil, we already saw that Bosch's paradise is no normal paradise and that his hell looks rather more like a horrific version of reality. The medieval eschatological framework is already full of cracks. Thomas More's Utopia is a written work. It presents a concept that is in fact a description of another form of social organization. This is the subject of a literary work not of a painting. Significantly, the book is not illustrated. The frontispiece reproduces nothing of the book's utopian content. However, in the medium of painting, there exists a work, and I think it is unique in this respect, that did in its time offer a vision of an ideal social structure. The work I have in mind is a large fresco done by Ambrogio Lorenzetti for the Sala dei Nove in Siena's town hall, a work that dates from 1337. <clears throat> the fresco painting was commissioned by the so-called Nine in Italian, I Nove, a title that was applied to the chief magistrates of Siena in the period between 1287 and 1355. If one is truly to appreciate this fresco painting, one must be familiar with Siena's 
socio-political background. Like Florence and other Italian cities toward the end of the 13th century, Siena struggled to emancipate itself from the nobility and to constitute itself as a city republic. There is no doubt that in the first half of the Trecento, these young cities experienced one of the most democratic periods in their history. Siena was governed by the wealthy bourgeoisie, primarily bankers and merchants. The municipal government per se, that is, those referred to as the nine, changed regularly every two months. Alongside the nine magistrates was the Consiglio Popolare, made of all the men who were eligible to vote. Only men, no women, nor did unpropertied citizens take part in the Consiglio. Its membership was also virtually limited to citizens who lived within the city itself, that is, not in the Contado the surrounding territory belonging to Siena. The official head of state was a Podesta, who was supposed to be a foreigner to Siena and was elected for a period of only six months. In 1337, the constitution was revised so to exclude the nobility from government. This circumstance may have provided the occasion for the commission of the fresco painting. Let's look at the fresco. The painting spans three walls of the Sala dei Nove. The windows occupy the fourth wall. The painted scenes represent good and bad government. Both the good principles and the bad are illustrated in the form of allegories and alongside depictions of the effects that each of the two kinds of government has on both city and countryside. I know nothing comparable to this work. This is a painting of a utopian, a utopian conception of an ideal urban society at a time in which monarchy was generally considered to be the best form of government. We can begin with the allegory of the good government. You see, on the left you see the, the allegorical form, and then on the other side you see the effects, first in the city and then in the countryside but I will show you now the, more, the things in more detail. What are the guiding principles behind an optimally functioning society? The picture is to be read from left to right. Here we see justice, justitia, sitting on her throne, hovering above her is her guiding principle Sapientia, wisdom. Queen Justice is shown in her double function as she who dispenses both punishment and reward. Thus, justice, guided by wisdom, is the supreme principle. Justice makes concord or harmony possible. Concordia is shown enthroned at the feet of Justitia, and she has a carpenter's plane in her lap. She smoothes out the irregularities, the inequalities. Connected to Justitia scales to Concordia and to each other by means of a cord. In Latin Italian, this is corda, hence the play on words, concordia. <clears throat> the male representatives of the city's ruling elite are shown walking in procession, guarded by soldiers, some of whom are on horseback. 
There are 24 men in the procession. These are most probably the ordinary, the high magistrates, who also, who, are, who also included in Norway. No one of them has been particularly highlighted, although they are all quite different as to dress, age and facial features. The court runs through the procession and finally leads to the oversized main male figure and thrown between the female allegories. He is characterized as an old man, richly adorned, scepter in hand, his left hand holding a medallion on his knee. On the medallion, we can just make out the Madonna and child, the symbol of Siena. The court, which links everyone in harmony, merges into the scepter in the old man's hand, the scepter, of course, being the symbol of power. Thus, we understand visually that the power to rule is legitimized by its connection to the citizens. Flanking the enthroned figure's head are the letters CSCV, which stands for Commune Senarum Civitatis Virginis, basically the Commune of Siena. This figure is therefore meant to represent Siena, the well-being of its citizenry. This is the only male, male allegory here, a fact that stands out. The explanation, I think, is that this figure is to be seen not only as a personification of an idea, but also as an embodiment, as it were, of the totality of the citizens of Siena, that is, of those who had the right to vote, all of whom were men. Hovering above the enthroned figure are the three Christian virtues, fides, faith, space, hope, and directly above the man's head, caritas, charity or love of God, who is shown bearing a flaming heart. At the feet of the majestic figure, we see Remulus and Remus and the wolf's head, all of which are reference to the myth of Siena's founding. Siena thought, similar to Rome, that they have been founded by Romulus and Remus. To the man's left, we see not only the virtues of classical antiquity, but also magninitas, generosity. She is dipping her hand into a large bowl full of coins. The medieval historian William Bowski rightly drew attention to this singularity as possibly being a reference to the fact that Siena, unlike other cities, was very generous in supporting institutions such as the university and also the arts and culture in general. We are shown the virtuous temperancia, temperance, holding an hourglass as a symbol of moderation and once again, justitia, justice. Here with a crown in her lap and the head of a beheaded man. Below her, crowned together in chains, are criminals and in the foreground, noblemen who have placed their castles at the disposal of the Republic of Siena. The latter group is also heavily guarded. To the enthroned figure's right is prudentia, wisdom or prudence. In her hand, she is holding an oil lamp in which three flames are burning. These cast their light upon three words inscribed on a scroll in her lap. Preteritum, presens futurum. The wise are those who think of the past, the present and the future. Next to Prudentia sits fortitudo, fortitude or courage, heavily armed and holding a shield and a mace. Clearly set apart from the others and highlighted is Parks, peace. Reclining on cushions, 
her head resting on her hand. Her head is adorned with a crown made of palm branches. She is also holding a palm branch in her left hand. She is dressed in a plain white robe, which is almost transparent. Her feet are resting on weapons that have been laid aside. She has been given particular prominence in the overall composition. The white color makes her stand out. She immediately attracts the viewer's eye. Let's sum up these observations. What is being solemnized is here is not a monarch, but the city republic, not including the women or their own proper tied citizen, but we must remember to put things into their historical perspective. The very composition is an expression of the democratic principle. The structure is horizontal. The figures have been arranged in isocephalic fashion, that is, all with their heads brought to the same level. It is largely a profane allegory. The supreme legitimation does not come from God, who traditionally gives a ruler his or her legitimacy. Here the ruling power is legitimized by wisdom and the virtues. Justice is the foundation. Without justice there cannot be harmony. Only the citizens, the full-fledged citizens, can give the city's leadership its legitimacy. The nobility must acknowledge this. Criminals who go against the common good must be punished. The maintenance of order in the city is militarily ensured. The common aim is peace. Peace that is imagined in the form of a bright, shining, almost transparent figure in a Chankai pose. In the lower ornamental border of the frescoes, just beneath Lorenzetti's signature, not far from Justitia and her scales, we see a framed inscription. This text is a commentary on the allegory of good government, and I quote it in full. Where this sacred virtue, justice, reigns, she unites the many souls. These thus united makes a common good their sovereign. He, in order to govern his state, forms a determination never to turn his eyes away from the resplendent countenances of the virtues that surround him. As a result, taxes, tributes, and the logic overlands are offered to him in triumph. For this reason, and there being no war, every kind of benefit for the citizenry takes effect the useful, the necessary, and the joyful." End of quote. <clears throat> we see then that it is possible in the medium of painting to give visual expression to the concept of an ideal form of government the potential for allowing us to conceive of such an ideal state is commonly considered to belong to the medium of language. In painting, this can be accomplished by means of allegorical representation. Ambrogio Lorenzetti is able to translate these abstract notions into visual form in such a way that we are able not only to decipher them rationally, but also to grasp them on an emotional level. The written word in the form of inscriptions and detailed texts, of which there are quite a few here, nevertheless play a significant role. The historian Randolph Stahn has rightly pointed out that the written word appears in the middle of the allegory of good government in a way that very much catches the eye. He interprets this as a signifying that the written word 
in the form of a constitution and status, had acquired new and fundamental importance in the context of the urban commune. In addition, the fact of putting things down in writing, to use a common phrase, is a reflection of the growing importance that business correspondence and commercial contracts had begun to acquire in Siena's flourishing economy. In the eyes of the city's citizenry, erudition and education, and education had more value than noble birth. The overall composition makes one think of a last judgment, but as has already been said, a last judgment that is thoroughly profane. The opposite of this is not hell, but tyranny on earth. This fresco unfortunately has been poorly preserved, which is kind of fitting for bad government. Tyramides, the tyrannical ruler, is shown armed and with fangs like those of a vampire, a characterization reminiscent of the devil. His hair has been arranged in braids around his head. <clears throat> a feature that gives him something of a feminine air. He's holding a chalice in his hand. His feet are resting on a goat, which symbolizes luxuria, lust. Above him, we see avaritia, greed, superbia, pride, in the sense of conceit, and vanagloria, vainglory, or vanity. To the tyrant's left is furor, fury, a hybrid creature holding a dagger in its hand. Next to this creature is Divisio. She is wearing a garment that is half black and half white. She is sewing a piece of wood in two. On one side of her garment, we can read the word see. On the other side, the word no. The row of figures ends of the, on the right with guerra, with war. Justitia, justice, bound with a rope, is seen lying at the tyrant's feet. To his right, we see fraud. Actually, neither a man nor a woman, a bestial figure. Then deceit, holding a small sheep that has a scorpion's tail. And finally, cruelty. As we can see, it is not the seven deadly sins that are represented here, but rather personifications of evil, which are direct, concrete references to the political functioning of the commune. Depict, depicted along the frieze above this allegorical scene are the seven planets and the four seasons. Human society is thus tied in with nature and the overall cosmic order. Along the lower frieze, which has only partially been preserved, we see the seven liberal arts and philosophy as well as five tyrannical rulers, all of whom met with a violent death. The room's east wall illustrates the effects of good government on the city and on the surrounding countryside. The city is an idealization, an idealized depiction of Siena with its black and white cathedral and its predominantly red brick houses. It would be too much to go into all the details here. But in this good city, people work, they teach, they build, and alongside work, which is of primordial importance, leisure is also highly valued, as symbolized by these 10 men and women performing a round dance in the foreground. This dancing figure has also made something of the nine muses. A wedding is being celebrated. 
This is here you see it on the left. And women are looking on from their window. I show you some more details. And you see here how this is how all these details and you see people uh, working on the roof. The city gates are open and people can be seen moving about, coming in and out the city. And um, we, we talked about this when we talked about nature, I told you how the, the, about the importance of this picture of landscape. This is the Contado, the surrounding uh, of Siena. And it is guarded by securitas. You see it in the upper and on top, um, the allegory of securitas, the security force. Who are there to ensure that the farmers, the merchants, the nobility, the beggars, everyone is able to go out and and in uh, with with security. Here you can see also a. Uh, a detail about the landscape. And on the other side, which has unfortunately been almost entirely destroyed, uh, you see the country uh, side, the city and the countryside perpetually at war. A country in which people are assaulted and robbed. A country in which women are raped. We, the viewers, take in this panorama, starting with the hell of tyranny, continuing, continuing on through the various allegorical representations and the complex messages that they convey, and fire, finally ending in paradise. A concrete conception of the good life that both city and countryside owe to the commune. Ambrogio Lorenzetti, like his brother Pietro Lorenzetti and countless other people throughout Europe, fell victim to the plague in 1348. Such social conceptualizations constitute an exception in visual arts. At least that's my impression. Of course, one also has to assume that a lot of works have been destroyed. And for that reason, there is a lot that cannot be known to us. And considering that research, as far as I can see, has not taken on the subject of utopias, the question as to whether these conceptualizations are or are not exceptions remains one that is difficult to answer. Uh, there does exist a very rich body of excellent social historical research devoted to Lorenzetti's frescoes. Most of it, however, focuses on their relevance to the political realities and concrete constitution of Siena. The frescoes have also been the subject of iconological research, which concentrates on establishing the written sources on which Lorenzetti drew ranging chronologically from Hesiod, Aristotle, Cicero, Seneca, to Thomas, Aquinas, Dante, and others. But of course, it wasn't Lorenzetti who made this theoretical conception, but of course, other people, but he painted it. Utopias emerge, especially in times of upheaval and crisis. Such a time of crisis was the Peasants' War in Germany in 1525. Here I should actually give some explanation as to the causes of the so-called German Peasants' War and provide an overview of the sequence of events. For that, however, we haven't got enough time. Suffice is to say that in the course of the Reformation, the peasantry, especially in the German-speaking countries, after numerous small local uprisings, banded together in order to find against institutionalized bondage 
and to put an end to massive exploitation, a state of affairs had, be had become exacerbated as a result of nation capitalization. A few radical leaders, such as Thomas Münzer, demanded outright the abolition of feudal rule. This was in fact one of the first struggles for human rights. The peasants were defeated. Thousands were massacred. In the course of the insurrection, some artists showed their solidarity with the insurgents. The medium concerned here was graphics inexpensive and able to reach masses of people. Most of the graphic work was political propaganda. There were a few exceptions. I'd like to show you a print by the so-called Petrarca Meister, Master, an anonymous artist known for his woodcuts illustrated the German, the German edition of Petrarca's remedies for the both good and bad fortune. The print I'm showing you, which was taken from the published work, bears the title von Adligem Ursprung, of noble origin. It is a genealogical tree showing the social hierarchy in the manner of an ancestor chart or a tree of Jesse. At the tree's roots, we see two peasants, one with a plowshare, the other with a pitchfork. The peasantry is literally at the root of the genealogical tree. Above the peasants are craftsmen, a merchant with a purse full of gold, and a man of learning, in other words, the middle class. The third level, is where we find the secular and ecclesiastical lords, a king, a nobleman, a cardinal, and a bishop. Above them, sitting on their thrones, are the emperor and the pope, the pinnacle of worldly and ecclesiastical power. Up to this point, what we have seen illustrated has been the ruling social order. But the woodcut does not end here. At the very top of the tree, we again see two peasants just casually relaxing, one holding a pitchfork, the other playing a flute. This is a utopian perspective of the future. Those who are at the very bottom and on whose shoulders society in its entirety rests, will someday be at the very top, free from the necessity to work, free to live in leisure. A simple image, easy for everyone to understand without a text. It seems obvious that the French Revolution is a time at which one should look for and expect to find visual representations of utopias. The result of the research, however, is rather delusioning. Let me show you a painting that played a crucial role in the run up to and during the French Revolution. The painting is Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatii, dated 1784. Originally not intended by David to be a revolutionary manifesto, it was after all painted five years before the revolution, it came to be interpreted as such by his contemporaries. They came in groves to view and admire the work as if on a pilgrimage. For his painting, David drew on an episode of Roman history that is known to us thanks to Livy's history of Rome. In the seventh century BC, the cities of Rome and Alba were locked into a struggle for supremacy. 
as a way of settling the dispute by proxy, the Kurati brothers of Alba were to fight to, to the death in a contest against the Horati brothers of Rome. The contest was encumbered from the very outset by an irresolvable conflictual situation between the two families. Camilla, the sister of one of the Horatii brothers, was engaged to one of the Curatii, and inversely, the sister of one of the Curatii was married to one of the Horatii. No matter how the combat would end, the woman would come out being the losers. The Horatii, that is, the Romans were victorious, also only one of them survived. All of the Kuratai died. <clears throat> David depicts a moment when the Horatii brothers standing before their father swear an oath to fight to the death for their fatherland. Here David achieved the composition of a new purely classical form devoid of any of the ornamentation of the Baroque period. The action is staged in a clearly defined space. The austere atmosphere is made dignified by the presence of Doric columns. The artist has dispensed with all ornamental elements. The three brothers are standing close together as in a phalanx, representing liberté, égalité, fraternité liberty, equality, and brotherhood. On the right, the women <coughs> are shown trying to comfort each other. <coughs> All of them clearly marked by suffering and grief. David's, con contem <coughs> David's contemporary saw in this painting a prelude to the revolution, a prelude to an unconditional struggle that each individual had to realize could eventually mean his or her own death and personal tragedy. The separation of the sexes is striking. The men are taking action and preparing to fight. The women remain passive and grieve. <clears throat> Soon later, of course, both during and after the revolution, the real exclusion of women only intensified. <clears throat> in spite of the active part women played in the revolution. <clears throat> To conclude, let's take a brief look at the work from the time of the Russian Revolution. Tatlin's Tower. Vladimir Tatlin was originally a painter. After visiting Picasso in Paris in 1913, he began working on relief constructions. Tatlin sought to pass from the depiction of reality to the construction of reality. In pursuing this end, he considered the materials themselves to be crucial. It was important to study the materials closely, looking for the forms that best highlight their properties the materials in question being especially metal, glass, and wood. To create art, wrote Tatlin, is to give form to material. He began working on his tower in 1919. It was to be the monument to the Third International. 
the plan was to erect the tower in the center of Petrograd. The model of the, law of the tower no longer exists except in the form of reconstructions. The tower itself was never built. So what you see here is the only photo that exists from this model. The model is, doesn't exist anymore and the tower was never built. And what you see here are re different kind of reconstructions. Tatlin's tower was conceived as an upwards spiraling metal construction tapering into a cylindrical apex. The whole construction built on an axis parallel to that of the earth. The tower was to be over 400 meters taller than the Eiffel Tower, which it in some ways resembles. Inside the construction, there were to be either three or four geometrical glass forms. The number depending on which reconstructed model is being preferred to. These forms were going from bottom to top a cube, a pyramid, a cylinder and a hemisphere each of which was to rotate at a different speed. These geometrical structures were to house the various organs of a future world government, as well as a world parliament. The glass cylinder rotating on its axis at the rate of one full rotation per day was to be an information center. The large cube at the bottom completing one rotation per year was to serve as a venue for lectures, conferences and congresses. The pyramid completing one full rotation every month was to house a Comintern executive. Communications installations were to be located in the hemisphere at the top of the tower. The tower was to project beams of light into the sky and the radio transmitter at the top was to sing, send constant broadcasts in all the languages of the world. The tower oblique spiraling form was meant to symbolize dynamic never-ending movement. The large rotating geometrical forms inside this world machine symbolize in a very literal sense the notion of revolution from the Latin verb revolvere meaning to rotate, to revolve, to return. <clears throat> so, as you can see, in the arts, there have been many attempts at finding ways to give formal expression to the notion of utopia. Its approaches have greatly differed with regard both to content and to form. As different as they may have been, they have all gone beyond the existing social order. And by doing so, they have in every case constituted a form of criticism, sometimes explicit, sometimes very implicit. Considering the current catastrophic political and ecological state of affairs in the world, I not only find that it would be wise, but I also think it is necessary for us to again redirect our thinking and our artistic activity in different directions. Directions that lead to a better future. Why shouldn't it be possible to imagine a world without war, without hunger, without hatred of everything foreign? A world that recognizes values other than efficiency and maximum profit. A world that at least tries to be more just, 
a world in which there is a sense of responsibility for nature. And why shouldn't it be possible to work towards creating utopias? Not fool's paradises, not castles in the air, not earthly paradises, but real alternatives, alternatives that emerge from an analysis of the past and the present. Thank you.